Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Kansas City, Kansas Community College Technical Education Center. How many Casey KCC students do we have here this morning? Raise your hand. Nice, nice, nice. How many um, guest colleges or universities do we have here today? Raise your hand. Oh, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Andrika. I'm the Director of Student Activities. And um, I'm just going to give you, do a little housekeeping things for you guys so you guys know where to go. Um, this is going to be the main hall. So on your agenda, when you see main hall, this is where we're looking at. Then there's like a, I don't know, I, I, can know, I think a number one or two. That's going to be room number two through those doors right there. The restrooms are right outside the hallway on this side. And there are restrooms down the hall down that side. And they're both kind of the same distance, so you could pick and choose whichever one you, you want to go to. We have some breakout sessions for you guys for during lunch. How many of you guys are hungry already? Hungry? Yeah. We do have coffee back there and some snacks, so you feel free to grab some of that. Um, but during the breakout sessions, we have directional signs in the hallways. So on your paper, it tells you what room they're in. So look for those directional signs in the hallway, and we're going to have some students out there helping guide you guys to whatever room you are in. We ask that when you go into the um, different breakout rooms, if you see that the room is full, um, please consider, you know, maybe there is a room that's not so full um, going into that one. That way we can, um, you know, spread the love to our speakers and not crowd too much into the room. Okay? Um, I think that's it. Did I think I missed anything? Well, first give a big uh, thank you to uh, Victor Ammons. He's the one who put this all together. Uh, this is, I had to confirm, but this is our fourth annual undergraduate research symposium. Isn't that pretty cool? And we're growing every year, so it's really awesome. So I want to welcome our Vice President of Academic Affairs um, to come up, Mr. Jerry Pope. Thank you, Andrika. Ooh, I feel on the spot up here. So uh, welcome, everyone, to this symposium. I think I've done the welcome now for three years. Uh, it's amazing to see it grow so much. So last year there weren't quite as many people in the room, so this year um, there were four. I think there's over, maybe it's on campus, another three or six. So congratulations on everyone who helped put this together and for all of you who are coming. So this is really exciting. Uh, I have a few remarks, and n I'm not a psychologist by training. I'm a musician, so I'm going to use my cheat sheet here. Uh, psychological science is at the brink of new and exciting explorations and discoveries. Psychological scientists make the central assumption that all actions and events follow certain knowable laws. Psychologists hypothesize that all behaviors and mental processes follow consistent and identifiable patterns. And intrinsic to this journey in psychological sciences is to be able to empirically articulate these laws and patterns. That is, into the laws and patterns of the psychological sciences. The purpose of this research symposium in the psychological sciences is to generate an interest and appreciation in the empirical bases of behavior and mental processes. Uh, this research symposium in the psychological sciences is actually metamorphizing. Uh, that's, that's kind of a cool word, metamorphosis. Beginning next year, this symposium will be known as the Student Research Symposium in the Social and Behavioral Sciences. So this name change reflects the move to add depth and be more inclusive by incorporating disciplines such as sociology, political science, and economics. We look forward to a bigger and better event next year. Mark your calendars. It's set for Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. Although there is some discussion maybe expanding it into two days. But certainly on April 2nd and maybe the day before or the day after. So kind of mark that on your calendar and be on the lookout for those communications. Um, information about next year's symposium will be sent out before this spring ends, right? All right, everyone, so it's good to see you. Welcome to Kansas City, Kansas Community College, and thank you very much for attending this really exciting event. Take care.
Good morning. I would like to welcome Dr. Laura King to our research symposium today. Dr. King is a tenured professor of psycho psychological sciences at Mizzou, is the distinguished curators professor of University of Missouri Columbia and the president of the Society of Person Personality <laughs> and Social Psychology. Her research is broadly concerned with the human experience of meaning of life and well-being. Dr. King's primary interests include happiness, the meaning of life, the narrative construction of identity, personality development in adulthood, and the ways that writing about life experiences influence psychological and physical health. She is also the current editor of the Personality and Individual Differences section of the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. A significant portion of Dr. King's research has been conducted with undergraduate collaborators and co-authors. Two of her former graduate students are both now in highly po prestigious positions after starting their academic journeys at community colleges. Fellow students and faculty, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker today, Dr. Laura King. Thank you so much, Mariah, for such a nice introduction. And it is really a pleasure to be here um, and share this day with you. And I'm so excited to know that all of you are involved in research. And I'm so excited to see some of the presentations and posters today. And yes, two of my very best students uh, came to me after starting out their academic careers in two-year institutions, and one of them got her PhD with me at Southern Methodist University, and she is now the Director of Community Supervision for Harris County in uh, Houston, Texas. And then I have another one who, I mean, went to multiple two-year institutions, found his, finally got his four-year degree, got his PhD with me at the University of Missouri, and is currently a full professor at Texas A&M University. So I really, I want to say to the instructors who are here how much I appreciate all the things that you have done for me. You have made my life better with the students that you've sent my way. And to all of the students here, whatever your goals are, and I know not everybody wants to be a psychology professor or even a clinical psychologist, but, if you, but uh, I am so excited for you to be on this journey. And I'm, of course, super excited to talk to you about a little bit about my work on the experience of meaning in life. And what I hope to do today is to convince you that this is true. Your life is meaningful. I am a world-renowned expert on the experience of meaning in life. And I'm here to tell you that your life is very meaningful. So psychologists, maybe because psychologists started out studying meaning in life, because of this very famous book by Viktor Frankl called Man's Search for Meaning, um, and this is really, this was, Frankl was a psychologist, a psychotherapist who was um, working um, in a Nazi concentration camp during the Holocaust. And out of those experiences, he wrote this very famous book that really started psychology's interest in the human experience of meaning. And maybe part of the reason why, uh, or part of the, this particular fact of the history of our field um, might explain why psychologists often have talked about the experience of meaning when it's absent, when it's lacking, when people feel like a life ex trauma has challenged their sense of meaning, uh, when people feel like they have to search for meaning. Um, and oftentimes, psychologists talk about meaning in life as something that we have to find, we have to search for, we have to struggle over and construct. And in fact, I do research on well-being and happiness. And if you go and chat with people who study uh, well-being, psychological functioning, uh, you will quickly find out that the experience of meaning in life is different. And psychologists want you to think that meaning in life belongs up on a pedestal. Like the happy life, oh, anybody can be happy. But what about the life of meaning? And so some psychologists will try to sell you books and workshops and uh, programs and life coaching to convince you that they can teach you how to have a meaningful life. So meaning, meaning in life is up there, something rare and unusual, only available to some 
people. And that idea, that notion has never sat well with me. It also would not have sat well with William James, who you may remember from Intro Psych, was one of, is recognized as one of the founders of psychology, right? The, the one who put the truly American stamp on psychology. And this is one of my favorite quotes from William James, which I do not have tattooed on my body, but I've actually thought about it. Anyway, all goods are disguised in the vulgarity of their concomitants in this workaday world. But woe to him who can only recognize them when he thinks them in their pure and abstract form. Everything good, everything good about human life is part of this life, everyday life. It's embedded in the workaday things we deal with, our routines, our hassles, uh, you know, the things we have to do, the things we love to do, our hobbies. If we, woe to us, right, if we cannot recognize that all the goods of life are embedded in our workaday world, they might be disguised, we might have to look hard for them, but they're here. And I agree with William James. He and I are on the same page about a lot of things. Um, that meaning in life is like that too. And to give you uh, maybe a sense of how uh, I ended up down this path and how I think about the experience of meaning, I wanna tell you a very brief story. Um, so many years ago, very many years ago, before my hair turned purple, uh, gray, I was in a new assistant professor at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. And I don't know, I decided, I had so much time on my hands that I wanted to do something, and I decided to become a literacy volunteer. And so, I, because, you know, when you're in a university setting, you spend so much time, right, reading and writing and then reading other people's writings, and then writing about those writings. And um, it, was, it struck me, it just was wrong, that there were people on the campus, working on campus, who couldn't read. And so I went through the training with the volunteer, Literacy Volunteers of America, and was assigned a student. And this was a big commitment. It was like four weeks of training, and then, with my student, we each signed a contract that we would meet twice a week, every week, for two years. And my student's name was Douglas. And Douglas was in his early 20s. He uh, had a couple of kids. He was a Af young African-American man. And he, um, so when I started doing literacy volunteer work, my idea was, I, had an Engl I was an English major as an undergrad, and like I was thinking, oh, we'll read poetry. I'll introduce my students to Shakespeare, like whatever. And, uh, but Douglas worked at the food service on campus. And he wanted, he was the cold cut sandwich guy, and he wanted to be the fry cook guy. And he would make a lot more money and it would be better for his family. Now Douglas had a high school diploma, but he could not read. He was an adult non-reader. And if someone has gone through 12 years of school and literally just has not picked up reading, right? It's one of the things humans do. Uh, he obviously needed individual help way earlier in his life. So we started meeting together in this little lab room that I had at SMU. And we worked on the exercises that I had been trained to do with him. And I did, th you know, we had, it was really cool. He was super cool, right? It was a struggle. Um, he could not read. He like really could not read. And yet I helped him get a library card. I helped him register to vote for the first time. We did all kinds of things together. But every week we would meet, we would do our exercises. And at the end of our meetings, we would try to read a book together. And I would read a paragraph, and then I would hand the book to him, and then he would struggle and try to read his paragraph, and then hand the book back to me so that I could deliver my paragraph with skill and poise, and then hand it back to him. Now you have to understand, we met every week, <laughs> twice a week, for almost two years, and he was making no progress. And I would say to him, Douglas, why, 
like, why don't you just give up? I'm not a good psychologist. I don't understand why you don't just give up. We're not getting anywhere. I don't know if this seems like it's working to you, but it doesn't look like it's working to me. And Douglas said, listen, Laura, I need to learn to read. You're willing to help me. What kind of idiot would I be if I didn't just keep on trying? And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> Yay, let's keep trying. And we kept trying, and we kept trying. So it's so weird. It's right around this time of year. Um, and in fact, we were reading a, a biography of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that had been written for young adult readers. So we went through our exercises this one day, and uh, then I opened up the book with some dread, right? Here we go. So I open the book, and I read my paragraph. And I hand the book to Douglas. And Douglas starts reading, like really reading. He's reading with the flow. If he gets to a word he doesn't know, he figures it out and keeps on going. The hair started to stand up on my arms. Like I couldn't believe that such a qualitative change was even possible. And I said to him, well, no, actually, I took the book back, read my paragraph, and then gave it back to him, and he kept on going. And I said to him, Douglas, like, do you realize what you're doing? Like, you're reading. You're really reading. And he said, I know. I said, what happened? He said, I don't know what happened. A couple of days ago, I was walking around, and I don't know. I just started seeing words places. He said, and it hit me, like a person doesn't turn, you don't come up to a word, figure it out and read it. You don't turn reading on and turn reading off. You're always reading. And I said, that's right. And he said, you know, Laura, the other day I was driving down the street and I've stopped at a red light. And do you know they put the names of the streets on signs on the corners so you always know where you are and i said that's right and then he said do you know something laura there are signs everywhere this story has inspired me honestly for 30 years Douglas was talking about reading, right? We don't turn reading on and turn reading off, right? We just automatically read, right? That's how we have the Stroop effect and all kinds of fun things in psychology. But we, I think we could think about what Douglas says as it applies to the experience of meaning. We don't turn meaning on and turn meaning off. We are always engaged with meaning in our lives. Their meaning is something that we don't have to always work so hard to have or create or struggle for. Meaning can happen to us the same way we accidentally just read a word because it happens that automatically. Okay, so let me tell you about my work relevant to this topic that maybe dispels some myths, some things you might believe about the experience of meaning in life. So I often get asked to give talks to hard scientists. <laughs> um, this was a chemistry professor at Mizzou. I was giving a talk to their hard science honors society that doesn't allow psychologists to be in it, but does invite us to come because at least our talks will be interesting. Um, and he, my talk was on meaning in life. And he said, Dr. King, how can you study meaning in life? Isn't it ineffable? Like it can't, this means, right? It can't even be defined. How can you study something if you can't define it? Well, we can define it. Many years ago, my students and I spent all this time reading everything we could find that psychologists had written about the experience of meaning in life. The experience of meaning in life, not the meaning of life, not like something that a um, theologian might tell you or a philosopher might talk about. I'm a psychologist, I'm interested in the experiences people have. And so we came up with this definition, that lives may be experienced as meaningful when they are felt to have significance, 
beyond the trivial or momentary, to have purpose or to have a coherence that transcends chaos, right? So these words in blue, significance, purpose, and coherence, these are themes that are in a variety of definitions that different psychologists have provided for the experience of meaning, and we're gonna come back to them towards the end of my talk when I tell you about some research that looks at these various pieces of meaning. We can also measure meaning in life, right? Psychology students know we don't just have a conceptual definition. We need to operationally define the variables that we're interested in. And so here are some exam example items of the scales that we use to measure meaning in life. My personal existence has a clear sense of purpose or my, my personal existence is meaningful. We just ask people. Rate on a scale from one to seven how meaningful your life is. Now when I talk about this with uh, very serious psychologists, they often get really upset. How dare you? How dare you even mention Viktor Frankl if you're just measuring meaning in life this way? But I think you'll see as we go along today that Viktor Frankl and I are on the same page, and many people in psychology have not read past the title of his book. Here's one of the weird things. We're just gonna use a puny little questionnaire to measure this deep, grand human experience of meaning, but Guess what? People who rate their lives as meaningful are better off in a bajillion ways than people who say their lives aren't meaningful. And you, you can see, like people who rate their lives as meaningful are less likely to die by suicide, even in the context of severe depression. Meaning, right, makes a difference. Um, it's related to lower incidence of psychological disorders. People who rate their lives as meaningful are rated as more socially appealing by other people who don't even know that they did that. People who rate their lives as meaningful show slower age-related cognitive decline, less risk of Alzheimer's disease, less ris risk of stroke, less risk of heart attacks, less risk of a second heart attack after a first one. It's good for you. People who say their lives are meaningful are better off in a host of ways. Their marriages last longer, blah, blah, blah. So even if it is, seems kind of puny to measure meaning in life using a questionnaire, these ratings matter. So let's talk about some questions like, does meaning in life require deep introspection, reflection, and construction? Do we have to sit around all day and navel gaze to figure out what our meaning in life is supposed to be? Sometimes psychologists describe meaning, right? What, where, what is it? We have meaning that is, we construct it and lay it over an otherwise chaotic reality. This drives me nuts. Is the world otherwise chaotic? Is all of the order that we experience a product of our noggins? Like I know we love the brain and it does so many great things, but the world might matter. I oh, here we go, this is very fancy. Thank you. Um, this is interesting because the, the, oh gosh, where did it go? Oh, the apple, it just kept going. Anyway, this is Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton, this is interesting. This is from a, literally a book that was based on an interview with Isaac Newton. And that he was asked, how did you come up with the law of gravity? And this is what he said, right? That he thought to himself, he saw a tree fall. He did, it's not, it's not apocryphal, it happened. And he thought to himself, why should that uh, why, uh, apple always descend perpendicularly to the ground? Why should it not go sideways or upward? This question, why? That's the question about meaning. Right, something bad happens to you and you ask, why me, why is this happening? And what, why on earth would I bring up Isaac Newton? Because Newton is telling us something. Sometimes the answer to the question of meaning is found in the natural laws of the world in which we live. The world that is, that has laws, it is lawful. You knew, right, that objects fall down, not up. That's the world, babies know that, infants know that, non-human primates know that. Here's another great one. I know all psychology students, their favorite topic is operant conditioning. Okay, so, does, okay, this rat, right, this rat is in um, a Skinner box, right? And he's 
he's being conditioned. He, I, I don't know, I'm gendering this poor guy. Um, but he's, he's being right trained to press the bar to get the food, right? And if you've ever done this, you know these rats will learn pretty quickly. They pick it up. It's exciting. I mean, it's kind of fun. I used to be the rat lab. Uh, I worked in the rat lab when I was an undergrad. Anyway, but think about what that rat's doing. He's figuring out, right, my behavior will lead to food. Food's important for survival. Or a dog with Pavlov, right? That dog is learning, oh, this signals it's time to eat. These animals are learning about reliable associations in the environment. And if you think about um, all of that you know about classical and operant conditioning, you know, right? These animals learn these things, and they learn them very well. Now take that animal out of the Skinner box and put it in the wild. What for the things that rat does, for the capacity to extract reliable connections from the environment to be adaptive in the natural world, guess what the natural world has to be like? it has to have reliable connections in it too. The world is not otherwise chaotic. Senseless things happen, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that the world itself is chaotic. This rat's behavior is telling us that this rat lives in a world that's characterized by reliable associations, principles, laws, so I'm arguing that objective reality often or typically does make sense. Senseless things, we remember them, we notice them, we think about them because it's not what we are adapted for, it's not the world that we're used to, it's not what we're wired for, and because they are weird and unusual. In fact, it turns out there's no evidence, none, that sitting around pondering the meaning of life actually leads to a greater experience of meaning in life. Thinking doesn't often lead to meaning. You know that already. And maybe I'm the only one, but you write, you write down a word that you've written down five million times, and you look at it, and the longer you look at it and think about it, you start thinking, is this even right? Wait, did I spell that right? Wait, does the I become before the E? I'm pretty sure, wait a minute, what? Right? Thinking may not be the best way to get to a sense of meaning. In fact, meaning in life is related to intuition, not analytical reflective processing. Meaning in life is negatively related to performance on measures of like deep reflection, tricky math problems. Relying on heuristics, right, those mental shortcuts, being on automatic pilot actually predicts higher meaning in life. So this, to me, I think is cool, right? But then it would suggest something. When experiences make sense, when the environment is rich in connections, life should be more meaningful, is it? Is life more meaningful at those times? We did a study to find out. So what we did, this is crazy, little goofy experiment. What we did is we showed people really pretty pictures of trees. This was an online study. 16 different pictures, and the tree pictures were all recognizable, uh, four from each of the four seasons, so spring, summer, fall, and winter. All right, so we told the participants in the study, we're gonna have you look at these pictures, and what we want you to do is rate the quality of the photographs. We're just interested in making sure that when people look at these on different machines, they all look good, blah, blah, blah. After they finished the task, they rated their meaning in life. Here's what they did not know. Half of them were randomly assigned, so we can say that, we are, that what we did to them is causing the change on the dependent measure. Half of them saw these pictures in random order. They're all super pretty, and they just saw them in random orders. The other half were shown the pictures in the, always following the cycles of the four seasons. Spring, summer, fall, winter. Spring, summer, fall, winter, four times. That's all, that's the only difference between the groups, and then they rated their meaning in life. The bright blue bars are the people who saw the seasonal pattern. Even though they didn't notice it, even though we didn't say, look, these are in seasonal order. Oh, my Lord. We asked them, do you see anything special about those pictures? 
everybody, e the groups were equally likely to say, oh yes, they were so great, <laughs> like whatever. Nobody figured out that they were seen, they saw, what they saw was the four seasons. When the world is rich with patterns, right, with reliable pattern, life does feel more meaningful. Then we start thinking, well, is there any way to think about that? process in more of a like everyday thing, not just tied to the seasons, but something that's more individual. And one idea was people's habits and their routines. So one of my students and I did this study, we collected these data at the University of Virginia when she was a postdoctoral fellow there. And what we did is we just beat them at random times during the day on their phones and they filled out a little questionnaire on which they said, uh, they rated their meaning in life and their mood and then they said whether what they were doing at that moment was on their routine or not. And it turns out that life is, it's just small, but life is a little more meaningful when people are engaged in their daily routine. And I think this is the kind of thing that we've completely ignored as psychologists because we always think about meaning in this big, profound context. No, just guess what? Getting up at the same time, going to bed at the same time. These, are, these routines, this is how we lay down our lives and establish these pathways through which we do those profound things. But wait, wait, no, it can't be. Doesn't meaning depend on profound experiences? So one of the things I got really, in, I should say, like I'm a first generation college student. I was a first generation college student. My parents uh, were, I, I come from a blue collar family in rural Ohio. And every time people, one of the reasons why psychologists approach to the experience of meaning so rubs me the wrong way is because it leaves my parents' lives out completely. As if, you have to read the right book, or you have to go to the right workshop, or you have to have a ton of money and resources and time, and you have to be able to just sit and think. They never had time for that. But I think their lives are incredibly meaningful. Some of the things, they had time for routine, they had time for family dinners. Okay, so one of the things I got interested in super early on was the experience of meaning in life and the experience of happiness. And everybody knows, like meaning in life and happiness are certainly positively correlated. Uh, and what everybody knows is, oh yeah, if you have more meaning, then you'll be happier. But nobody actually has studied this. <laughs> um, and psychology students, happiness and meaning in life are correlated, but correlation, thank you, exactly. What if it goes the other way, y'all? So we're like, let's see if we can see if it goes the other way. So here's what we did. We just did an experiment. It's very easy to put people in a good mood. It really is. You give them candy or money, have them listen to happy music. We use a lot of Dave Brubeck in my lab to put people in a good mood. Um, and so we randomly assigned Mizzou students to a positive, neutral, or negative mood condition. Negative mood condition, they're forced to listen to Russia under the Mongolian yoke at one-third speed. It's very, it's a downer. And then right afterward, um, they rated their meaning in life. Ah! Right? Negative mood, by the way, notice that the negative mood condition is not lower than the neutral condition. And kind of put a pin in that, because we're going to come back to it in just a few seconds. But putting people in a good mood increased their meaning in life. And we have done this now with uh, elderly people, community adults, you name it. Um, if you put someone in a good mood and just do it in whatever silly way, it makes life feel more meaningful. This is just to show you like why, how a positive mood can affect things. So if we look at people who are high in religiosity or people who have lots of friends, right? These are robust predictors of the experience of meaning. But even if you're not religious or even if you're lonely, if you're in a good mood, you have the same level of meaning in life as someone who has those resources. This isn't to say, oh, then just be happy and never think about anything else, but rather during difficult times, m little moments of simple pleasure can boost a person's sense of meaning. But, but, but isn't meaning in life a rare accomplishment? Isn't it really hard? 
We have had reviewers of our work say things like, well, if meaning in life can come from things as silly as being in a good mood and doing your daily routines, wouldn't life be super meaningful? And I'm like, yes, it would. Is it? What if it is? It kind of is, y'all. So what we did is we looked at every study. This is, these first few are just, uh, these are uh, representative samples in the US uh, in which people were asked about their meaning in life. And the answer was like yes or no, right? Does your, li does your life feel, did your life feel, did you feel that your life has meaning, I'm sorry, in the last uh, three weeks? 95% of the respondents said yes. Uh, do you feel your life has an important purpose or meaning? 83% of the people agreed or strongly agreed. Then this, these data come from a Gallup Global Poll. Uh, this work was conducted by uh, my intellectual um, grandfather, Ed Diener, and Shige Oishi, and they used, they had, a, they had representative samples from 122 nations, like literally people riding with their laptop on camels collecting data from people about their meaning in life. And the participants were asked, do you feel your life has a special purpose or meaning, yes or no? And I just wanted, this is the US, so we're right here. Uh, we can talk about what that red line is about later if we have time. Do you feel that your life has a special purpose or meaning? At the level of nation, averaging across the nations, 91% of the people said yes. Now, I know, right, I always have these college students like, oh, those, those people are crazy. They only think their life is meaningful because they don't know what meaning in life is. That drives me nuts. Well, maybe they actually do. Why is it so upsetting to find out that tons of people think their lives are meaningful? It's awesome, right? It's, this is really good news. If I said, oh, 91% of the people said they were depressed, or 91% of the people said they had, their life had no meaning, would that somehow make that more believable? They just did. Now, of course, they asked a yes or no question. And maybe people have low meaning, and they're just saying, yeah, a little bit, yes. OK, so Samantha and I did this project. And that, you know, I can say I, we, but she did all the hard work. We got every single uh, study ever done where they measured meaning in life. And this is one of the scales uh, that people often use, a very common scale. And this is how many studies reported these various means on meaning in life. On a scale from one to seven, as you can see, this big jump right here is at four and a half to five on a scale from one to seven, which is significantly different from the midpoint of the scale. But look at this, if, if this fascinates me. So life is pretty meaningful, right? These, these samples out here, these aren't, oh, it's probably just a bunch of college students. No, it isn't. These are people who have been um, in an inpatient psychiatric facility, people suffering with uh, drug addiction, people who've had breast cancer, people who have had um, alcoholism, people who've recently had a heart attack. This one little blip down here, that upsets me. That is a that, those are college students. It's one sample of American college students. Now, I do think that when you're at the traditional college age, it's the time to search for meaning, to figure out who you are, what do you want to do, what is going to be the thing that you're going to dedicate your routine to to make your life feel meaningful. I get that. But I really want you all to know <laughs> While you're doing all that thinking, in the background, your life is meaningful. That, right, there's the, the meaning that you have in your life goes beyond that, that struggle. So meaning in life, yes, it can be defined and measured. Yes, it predicts many important outcomes. It is not laid over the reality of chaos, but it is embedded in intuitive experiences. It comes from simple things like engaging in routines and being in a good mood, and it is common, not rare. Now, quickly, I want to talk. Oh, and so see, look, Viktor Frankl agrees with me. What is demanded of us is not, as some existential philosophers teach, to endure the meaninglessness of life. No, 
it is to bear our incapacity to grasp its unconditional meaningfulness in rational terms. It is unconditionally meaningful. It's going to come from all kinds of places, but I know it is meaningful. Now you might be thinking, yeah, but what about these terrible times, right? Bad things happen. And we've done research on this topic in, a very, in various ways, and I just want to talk very quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, one of the things we've been interested in is adverse childhood experiences, which are basically, you know, bad things that happen to kids in their childhoods, so neglect, abuse, uh, parental incarceration, parental mental illness, um, mental health issues, uh, death in the family, divorce, and so forth. These are called ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and they're related to a host of like bad outcomes, poor outcomes for people. So we were interested in looking at how adults who have gone through difficult childhoods experience meaning in life, right? And for this particular study, we really focused on those facets I talked about. Coherence, that is the feeling that life makes sense. Significance, the feeling that a person's life matters. And purpose, the sense that you have goals that compel you to go forward. And I have those little asterisks there just because for our purposes, we really expected ACEs, those negative childhood experiences, to be negatively related to coherence and significance because the, the basic foundational uh, tasks of childhood, right, are getting a sense of self and a sense of the world, which are really relevant to those aspects of meaning. So we, um, I'm going to show you this. This is silly, but I can't help it. This is just a big correlational study. Don't even worry about what any of it means. All I want you to do is notice that empty spot. Here's ACEs, negatively affecting coherence, negatively relating to significance. Both of them right, come into global meaning. But look at this big hole. ACEs have nothing to do with purpose. What? So we did this experiment. We had students at Mizzou. It's a within-person experiment, so you know they did both conditions, and they did them in counterbalanced order, but order didn't matter, thank goodness, because I don't know what we would have done if it had. So first they rated their ACEs, and then they were asked to write about a very positive experience from childhood or a very negative experience from childhood, and immediately after each writing, they rated the facets of meaning. How does it make you feel? Does your life make sense? Did you feel like you mattered? Do you have a sense of purpose? So after, this is just focusing on the negative memory condition, right? So they wrote about a negative childhood memory, and this is coherence, right? So as the bars get lighter, people have more ACEs, OK? After writing about something negative from childhood, the more you have, uh, the more ACEs you have, the lower your sense of coherence. The more ACEs you have, the less significance you experience. But look at purpose, y'all. Oh my god, I couldn't believe it when it came out. The harder their childhood was, the stronger their sense of purpose after thinking about those negative times. So when experience doesn't make sense, when it tells us that we actually don't matter, guess what? Purpose is still there. Purpose remains. Why? Well, we talked about this a lot, right? I, here's what I think. I think that Viktor Frankl and I agree yet again. Frankl said when he was in the concentration camp, people were having these conversations about, like, do, will this experience matter? Do our lives have meaning? And people would often say they will if we escape. They will if we survive. And Frankl said, a life whose meaning depends upon such happenstance would not be worth living at all. Do we, does, do we always matter? No, right? We're all going to die, right? I mean, we may not always matter. Does life always make sense? No. Random things happen. But here we have, we always have a sense of purpose. Purpose does not depend on such happenstance. So when psychologists have put meaning in life on a pedestal, they've done really stupid things, in my opinion. They've been preoccupied with the search for meaning, 
instead of thinking about meaning when it's present in people's lives. They've asked very few, very limited set of questions about the actual experience of meaning. They've ignored the many things that make life meaningful. And they've missed the most surprising slash awesome news of all. Your life is meaningful. It comes from so many places. We have friends and family, people. We have the capacity to smile and laugh at, some, at, a, at a movie, to have a good dinner with someone, to engage in our daily routine, to be there for someone who needs us. We live in a world that has, where objects fall down, not up. We have winters that are followed by springs. And even during really difficult times, we have our own voice, our own sense of purpose. Douglas was absolutely right. There are signs everywhere. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Who's next? Thank you. All right. Wow, right? Wow? Yeah. Okay. Well, we are going to have It's and it's not that far away. It's only 2 hours, guys. Um, we're going to take a quick 10-minute break. Um, so there are restrooms on this side and restrooms on that side. So take stand up, grab some snacks, give me coffee or water, and um, we'll be back here in 10 minutes. So that's like right at noon ish. We'll be here 11.59. How about that? 11.59.
All right, guys, we have two minutes. Two minutes before we get started again. Two minutes. All right, guys. Woo, that sounded funny. All right, we are about to begin. So if everyone would go ahead and come over and have a seat. All right. So if you're following the agenda, um, we are a little different. Our time is a little off because we forgot to put the break in there. Um, we noticed last year everyone needed a break in between, right? <laughs> so, um, so the next we have our next speaker, and after that, then we'll break for lunch in the breakout sessions. Okay, all right. Hello, everybody. Um, wonderful afternoon to you all. Um, I will be introducing Dr. Andrew Johnson. Um, Dr. Andrew Johnson is a professor of psychology in his 26th year at Park University. He is also the... <laughs> okay. It is very cool indeed. Um, he is also the director of, of the Pearl Psychology Laboratory and Psychi faculty advisor. He received his PhD from, from Kansas State University in experimental psychology with an emphasis in cognition. He, he is active in the Association for Psychological Science, American Psychological Association Division II, and the Society for Teaching of Psychology, Midwestern Psychological Association, and the Missouri Academy of Science, where he is currently serving as section chair for, this, as section chair for the social slash behavioral sciences. He, he is also the visiting scholar at Universidad Panamer Panamericana in Agu Aguas Calientes, Mexico, and Universidad de Sare in, in Bogota, Colombia. I hope I pronounced all of those correctly. Um, he, he is re, his research interests are in social cognition, creativity assessment, figurative language processing, cognitive maps, and the, and the scholarship of teaching, and science slash pseudoscience. Please join me in welcoming Dr. An Dr. Johnson for his, for his presentation entitled Superheroes, Super, Vi Super Villains, and Super Distortions. Thank you, Jules, and thank you to Victor and the rest for inviting me to come. So some of you may have heard a little bit of this. I, I gave a 
version of this at PERC in November. And if you were there, you're going to hear some similar things. And if not, you're going to hear something completely new. So thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be with you and share some of these things related to superheroes. And not surprisingly, superheroes are interesting. And when is our year 1938? It was a great year to be alive. And that was the introduction of Superman. And if you want to know some trivia, there were only two other quasi superheroes who were mentioned before that. One was the Phantom and the other one, Zorro. So maybe that'll pop up on a quiz or something and you'll nail that one and impress people. So. That's 1938, and what do we have now? The same type of characters. People love superheroes. How much so? If we looked at the top grossing movies across the last 20 years, the majority of them come from superheroes. And we're talking Avengers back in 2012. We're talking Frozen, no superheroes in there that I know of. People with issues that need psychology really badly, perhaps. We are talking Transformers, well, less superhero, well, kind of ish. We're Star Wars, yes, we have superheroes in there. I think that would apply. We're having Avengers Civil War, Star Wars again, Avengers again, Avengers again. And then we get one of these items, which is in Japanese. And by, my, by the way, my Japanese is really horrible. But this is called Mugen Train. And that's, I, I guess, one of my students said, oh, that's um, Dragon Ball something. What's that? Demon Slayer. Demon Slayer. See, exactly. And you know what that says? Even though I may not know all these things, they're popular. That people feel comfortable mentioning that in a presentation. Thank you. And then what, what we have Spider-Man back again, 2021. And that only leaves us with one year, 2022. Any ideas what the most popular movie was last year? Avatar, yeah. So, and then what we get, we get the saw, I said, oh yeah. Yeah, maybe yours was that Top Gun Maverick came in second, sorry, as he flies into the, <laughs> yeah. So, I want to try something a little bit different, and I'm going to introduce a little bit of family feud here. And because superheroes and supervillains are so interesting, let's see how well you do. So, you know, the typical round of um, Family Feud where we put some items here on the board. Top eight answers on the board. And we're going to play this for superheroes and supervillains. How well will you do? And, yes, show our, show our question, please. So, Jules is just more than... Um, my, my president of Psychi. She's, she's my buddy and she's going to be my tech person here. Um, by the way, there's something in here that's worth noting and it's called GPT-4. If you've been watching the news, there is something called, um, a company called OpenAI. And they have this wonderful chat GPT that you pose questions to and it writes your paper for you. And this was only introduced in what? late November, early December, and it has taken the world by storm. So we're gonna also bring this into this presentation, not only GPT-4, which is the current version of it, but also GPT-3.5 Turbo. <laughs> and it'll be interesting to make some comparisons here. So I posed both the 3.5 Turbo and GPT-4 the following question, what are the top eight superheroes. Well, really, I did the top 10, but I, on this one, I can only fit eight. So we're going with eight. So what will artificial intelligence tell us here? Okay, remove that and let's put up the top eight. So I hear like Superman, Superman, Batman, Batman. It almost sounds like rhythmic here. 
<laughs> so did, I heard Superman. Is Superman on the list? Hey, congratulations. It's number one. According to whom? An AI system, GPT-4. Okay. So now you can't say Superman anymore. <laughs> As I, seeing if you're paying attention, right? Another one? Spider-Man. Is Spider-Man on the list? Ah, number three. Huh, what's number two? <laughs> Survey says? There we go. Now we, we have what? Five left? Uh, is Iron Man on the list? Is Deadpool on the list? Deadpool isn't on the list. Not a surprise. I heard Wonder Woman. Is Wonder Woman on the list? Ah, number four. Hey, we got this side going. And what about this side? Let's see if we can wrap this up. Captain America. Oh, nice. Thor. It's Thor, and then I heard Black Panthers. Black Panther in the top eight. Oh, sorry. And that just leaves us with one. I heard, I heard Hulk the loudest. Hey, congratulations. And this is GPT-4. But what's really interesting is here's your first super distortion. I presented this both to 3.5 and 4, and uh, they came up with different listings. Huh. Really, really interesting. 4 focused on largely DC and Marvel characters. 3.5 Turbo picked up some interesting ones. And you'll notice that the top four on here are similar. And then I heard some other words. So we see the flash appears. Captain America saves in the same position. Iron Man moves position. Hulk is on there. And then those of you who said Black Panther, oh, he's on there on 3.5 Turbo and then rounding it out with Wolverine. So what's really interesting, and what is the distortion? The same question posed to the same source came up with a different lineup. Do you want stability in your life? <laughs> it's not gonna come from a listing of our superheroes. And you know what? This is the easy one. And before I move on to our villains, I just want to point out something else. Well, let's ask Google. And what you see here is the Google representation. And if there's one thing on, on this, you could only fit on five. But what I wanted to do was to take the stable four. And that is Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, and Wonder Woman, and then examine the Google trends across 10 years. And what you're going to notice is that Google says for these, well, they're in a different order. And then here's the distortion. It's all about when and where. So the where for this is worldwide because place matters. The second part of this is when matters. So this is in the last 10 years. And you can notice that some of these spikes represent popularity, bursts, most likely, that's when they were in their movies. But if we look at the averages of those, and that's why we use averages, right, to grab an overall trend, we can see that in the very bottom corner. Who comes in number one? The Batman does. Who comes in number two? Spider-Man. Superman, number three, and Wonder Woman in that same position, number four. So if you're following, here's the distortion. 
it depends upon who you ask. So I guess if you ask enough sources, you'll get the lineup you want. Oh, that's kind of sad. But it's important to know that distortion and for us to know it because then what question do we ask? When and where? And the other part is like who? Who was involved in this? And this was the easy one. You ready for villains? Um, I gotta move on, so we, yeah, you gotta be ready. And faithful helper, would you demonstrate or show us the question? It's not a surprise. It's gonna be the same thing as before. And we're asking chat GPT-4. Top villains. So I heard, I heard a Loki in here. Do we have a Loki on our list? Jules. Oh, sorry. Joker, oh my gosh. That's unmistakable. Oh, so if you said Joker, congratulations, you named the top one. And if this is actually, you know, Family Feud, you would say, we're gonna play. I heard Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor's on there. How about Thanos? Thanos is number two. I heard Dark Side over here. Oh. I heard Magneto. I heard Darth Vader. Sorry, not so sorry. So let me just pause here for a moment. And did you notice something interesting behaviorally? When it comes to the superheroes, here's all these names. And now when it comes to the villains, Joker. But Joker's already up on the board. Joker again. <laughs> Have we exhausted all of your villains yet? No. Green Goblin. Oh, all right. Green... Penguins up there. <laughs> well, you've done all your, all three. I'm so sorry. Now it's time for the reveal. Number, Dr. Octopus. And number eight. Yeah, and then I get a like, who? <laughs> Who's that? Yeah, we're not up on our superheroes, but Superman would be. So, and then what's really interesting, when I said Superman would be, what is my, my relation? It is in relation to the superhero. Hmm, interesting thing. So much like before, there is a distortion here. So here's the comparison between ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo and 4. So now I'm going to come over to Michael. Michael, you know when you said Darth Vader? Yeah, <laughs> yeah GPT 3.5 agrees with you, but puts him at number three behind Thanos. Look at the list here. The same question, the same time but the same machinery acted a little bit differently. Dracula and Maleficent. And you go, oh, okay, I can work with that. So what is the distortion? Different lists. So don't we wanna know, tell me the definitive top ones. Yeah, I do, but there is no stability there. And furthermore, what makes a person a superhero? Is a vigil ante a superhero? Check out these characteristics of vigil antes. Wealthy, cape, ridiculous gadgetry, martial arts, kind of nutty, impressive intelligence, amoral, goofy period, uh, named vigil ante. <laughs> There's only one in this whole list, you can see that. And then there's the uh, ones I can't read without 
getting low, 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 and the last one incredibly fit. And who fits the bill for most of these? Batman, who according to Google trend information is the top superhero identified. Hmm, a little bit of a distortion, at least in my view, although he handles individuals who are not making good choices, as my mom would tell me. <laughs> so let me jump past this a little bit, and let's look at some cross-cultural, because place matters. And yeah, welcome to our, our DC Marvel world. There is a geographical distortion, and you can see it represented up here. Welcome to the United States, home of the most of these places where these superheroes and villains hang out. Really? Yeah. Look at Central America and South America. Hardly anything. Africa, what? I think there's Wakanda in there somewhere. But it's cloaked, so you don't know where it's at for sure. And then look at Asia, Russia, hardly anything at all. Wow. So what does this tell us and all those other people from around the world? We are number one. But I will say it's getting better. There's getting more representation. And I find that so heartening. So I went back to Google and I entered some names related to associations with the color black and superheroes. And the three top ones that popped up were Batman, Black Widow, and Black Panther. And depending upon where you're at, it, it changes. So in the middle are the average Google trend information. And who grabs the top? Well, Batman does. And following that, it's Black Panther and then Black Widow, yeah because of she. Hmm. I said that out loud, didn't I? Yeah, the she's take back seat right now. But it's getting better. In the extreme part, in Brazil and Turkey, just Batman. And then in other countries, for example, at the other extreme, Nigeria, we're going to go with Black Panther. Not a surprise. But... Oh, then there's Black Widow. Eh. Beyond the black associations, how about superheroes associated with the color red? The averages kind of grab, okay. Spider-Man is on the top, followed by the, f not Flash, Iron Man, S Superman, and then the Flash comes in. But on the extreme, Venezuela says, we love Spider-Man. But Brazil says, who's Spider-Man? We like Superman. Where matters so much. One more for you here. And this is with blue associations. And who grabs blue? Batman again. And what did ChatGPT 3.5 and 4 say? He comes in second. Now, the rest of us say he comes in first. Except in Nigeria, Superman comes in first. Batman comes in second. But in Turkey, it's all Batman, almost. And the average, Batman grabs it. So why is it important to know these things? Where matters? Who matters? So as a part of our research on distortions, we asked our participants for certain characteristics of superheroes. And one of these, we asked them, we, we presented them with Lego pictures. And why? Because there's a distortion that's going to happen in here. I won't tell you right now, but I'll allude to it. So we presented this Lego picture. I'm going to identify the superhero. And their secret identity. And we wanted to know if 
those were equal numbers. Surprisingly, as you look through all of these, there, there are no 100%. And maybe that's because they're not familiar with these characters. Maybe they're, maybe just the head part has thrown them off. And then some of them, it's like, I don't even know what this is. It's a guy with a helmet, Ant-Man. Who's Ant-Man? I don't know, and Ant-Man has a name, right? Yeah, but we don't know, we don't care. So some of these low percentage names, and what we came out of this is that our, our, super, our superheroes' identities are safe. Not a whole lot, they're not gonna stick around a whole lot. And then beyond that, we wanted to look at information about, do you, can you identify the universe they're in? But we just use DC and Marvel ones to make it a lot simpler. So we received no 100%. The top one for the correct universe came with, wait, who is that? Captain Marvel. You know all these things, don't you? You're a superhero nut? Yeah, very, very cool. So it's Captain Marvel at 83%. Superman, Thanos in the middle at 70%, 71%. That shocked us. That's really, really low. And then, who's that? <laughs> All I hear is, <laughs> Green Goblin. <laughs> and 45, what universe he is? I don't care. I just watch him. And that, this was for our American standard equivalent. So we divided our sample depending on their preference of metric or American Standard. That'll come in in the next part here. And then the metric one, uh, fairly comparable, but that Green Goblin guy, uh, who knows who Green Goblin is? Yeah, he was a couple Spider-Man ones, and that's about it. Correct status, here was the alarming one. The correct status is identifying them, are they a superhero or a supervillain? and no 100% like we expected. The top one, 92% was on the American standard of Iron Man. Green Goblin made it to the middle, way to go. And then 55% of, Ooh, someone wants to represent on that side. I love it. Yeah, 55%, a witch, is a witch good or bad? Yeah, that depends. Then that's the answer that we hated our parents telling us when we asked them things. And our instructors as well, I guess. And then on the metric one, 92% for Captain America. And what we expect that to be higher? Scarecrow who battled Batman coming in at 79%. And then Catwoman, yeah, at the bottom. So, and what does this tell us? There's distortions of our knowledge. Some items we just don't grab and keep, and that's okay. Maybe we just watch those movies just to enjoy them. So what we have here is we ask these individuals to rate the height and weight of our superheroes. And this is a bullseye representation. And what that means, if you're in the middle, you are accurate. And then as you go out the rings, off, <laughs> whoa, and then way off, don't tell anyone. And what we discovered is those individuals who measured this in inches, our American, our standard American equivalent, they're off. They grossly missed the height and weight of these superheroes making the females shorter and thinner than what they were actually portrayed. And then for the males, making them shorter and fatter than what they actually were. Distorted, not only for inches, but also on the metric side as well, but not as much so on the metric. And don't ask me why, I can't tell you. We didn't include those questions, but they were a lot more accurate. So that's on the, the height side. And maybe there's this aspect about the looking glass self, making 
us more similar to them. Or them more similar to us. I should have said that. I'm sorry. So here's the weight side. Here's our American Standard one. And there is a few more blips in the middle of all of that. And some are way on the outside. Distorted views of these characters as they pertain to ourselves. Not only in the American Standard, but also in the metric. Not a good way. And as I, as I presented this, in a high school class, one of the students said, but this is off because... When I think of S Superman, I'm thinking of Henry Cav Cavill, Cavill? <laughs> yeah, you, you floated all the other ones except for this. Oh, yeah. So here's one of the distortions. As they were thinking about these individuals, I bet they were thinking about actors instead of the character. That's one of those distortions. And I suspect that is one of the things that threw off this information. But it's easy to do, right? The actor then becomes the character. But we know that's not the case. But it's difficult to do psychologically. So when we see that superhero in another movie, we expect that, that same role, character, to be applied. But not so. And some of these are way, way off. So giving you just a few little snapshots of that. On the Wonder Woman side, her height is six foot. And the estimate was 66 inches, six foot, or five foot six. And her weight, 165 pounds. But our participants said 121 pounds. And so and then you're in, in, in imagining this and like wow what a what a distortion on the the thanos as a as a marvel one height 80 inches he's purple <laughs> yeah, so they could be anything right they rated him as six foot two but 80 80 inches tall weight uh 985 pounds you're not inviting him to sit on your couch, in other words. And then Thor. You know, Thor's not from the world, the, our Earth. 79 inches. Six foot seven. 640 pounds. Just off, off. But what do we do? We rely on those characters then to address those height and weight things. And then the same thing we see on the Batman, Joker, and Superman side. And if I asked you to do these, I suspect you would be off as well. And look at Joker's information. How tall is he? Six foot six. Is this the Joker you see in your head? Now, then you share these distortions. So I want to just move past and mentioned some distortions of association as well. That, did you know there was a, a color palette? So for superheroes, welcome to the colors. Blue, red, and yellow. That's your assigned color if you're a superhero. And you can see all those different superheroes and how they fit in that palette. But if you're a supervillain, no, you can't have palette. There's another palette for you. And it's in the purple and green and this yellow one. Hmm. Look at all of these distortions. So if you want to create your own super, be your own super, don't. But, well, now you know the color palette you have to stick with. Hmm. This information up here shows the top superhero or villain for that matter that's associated with colors or combinations of colors and you want to have the top association because that means more popularity and more recognizability and what you'll notice across all of these there's some that appear over and over again batman 
Spider-Man and Superman. Those are the ones you have to compete for association. And there's our, our secondary ones as well. So that's the difference between our sample and Google Trends. So for example, on black and yellow, our results said Wolverine. Google said Batman. And the same thing with our orange and green. Aquaman is top, but Google said it's Hulk that grabs that. So I just want to mention some other aspects here as I, as I wrap things up and make sure that I'm in a, have I gone over? Yes, I have gone over. I'm so sorry. Because the only thing standing between you and lunch is me. And I don't want to do that. However, let me just say it in future directions here because I'm at the end. I'm really interested in measurement. And there is no standards here. So where do we go from here? Trying to to understand how do we measure this accurately, especially when we're taking issues related to place, person, and time. So with that, I will say thank you for allowing me to share the space and cut into your lunch. All right, well, we are at lunch and we're gonna do the breakout sessions, okay? So um, if you are going to be in a breakout session, what? first of all, everyone pull your, look at your agendas and do you know where you're going? Here. Look at what, which one you're gonna go to so you're not walking and looking at the same time, okay? All right, if you know where you're going, the uh, G102, K104, 2, 104, and D, 111 is all that way. If you are going that direction, there are lunches and there are drinks out in the hallway, so get your lunch and drink and go ahead into your breakout session. If you are going into the smaller main room, you're gonna go to your right. And if you're gonna stay here, we have two sections. Only get the lunch if you're in here.
How many of you guys feel refreshed? Nap time? Need a nap? Yeah. All right. How many of you guys, uh, well, hopefully you guys enjoyed your guys' breakout session and you guys were able to ask questions and network with some uh, other students here, right? All right. I think we have some, hopefully some more students will come back here. All right. So we are going to kick off with the afternoon session. Um, so if, uh, where's our speaker? She was right here. Where'd she go? Oh, there's our speaker. All right, I, th I was looking for you. All right. Hey, let's make a little bit noise. Let's give our next speaker a round of applause. How about that? You turn back one slide, please. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay, so um, today I'm going to be addressing maternal health and gynecological health care in incarcerated women. Um, so the first thing that I want to look at is the mortality rates. Um, and according to the CDC, black women are actually three times more likely to die from pregnancy-related causes um, than white women are. Um, and this is actually for multiple reasons, but the CDC actually states that multiple factors contribute to these disparities. Part of it has to do with the variation in quality health care. Part of it has to do with underlying chronic conditions, structural racism, and implicit bias. Um, and all of those can really be explained. For example, quality health care. Um, in different places, different health cares are available and everyone gets different coverage. Um, and then for underlying chronic conditions, people are not very likely to be diagnosed with things that they have. Um, so people live with their lifelong not knowing that they have it and therefore it contributes later on to their fatalities. Um, then to deal with structural racism and implicit bias, more times than not, a lot of black women and other women of color experience not being listened to in doctor's offices. Um, and this can just be experienced through like, for example, if it's a black woman who has a white doctor, um, she's more likely to die than if it's a white woman with a white doctor. But when you look at white women who are taken care of by white doctors versus black doctors, there's no discrepancy. It's purely with black women treated by black male doctors, I mean white male doctors. Um, so part of this also has to do with the concerns of people being overlooked. And one case of this actually has to do with Charles and Kira Johnson. Um, and this happened like a few years ago. <laughs> And it's written in an author, I mean, written in an article by Mossberg and Romine in 2022. Um, and basically what happened is Kira and Charles went in to have a scheduled C-section and everything went perfectly fine. She came in, she gave birth to her son, and then she was sent to her own room to be in her bed. And while she was there, it was about two hours in when Charles, the husband, started noticing blood in her catheter. And he thought that was strange, so he went to some nurses and some doctors to see if there was anything wrong and they basically excused what he said and didn't take anything seriously. And over those hours, it was like 12 hours before anyone actually came in to check on her, it just kept filling with more and more blood. And eventually, it was like many, many hours later, doctors were like, we're gonna order a CT, but it was never actually filed. And she actually ended up passing away from postpartum hemorrhage and blood loss. Um, and I think that this is a really good example of how concerns are often overlooked in these cases because it wasn't even the wife, it was the husband of her and she could not get across, he could not get across the point that she was in danger and she ended up losing her life and now he's raising his son alone without his wife. Um, so these four things at the bottom are four common causes of postpartum like death. Um, for example, postpartum hemorrhage is when you have like internal bleeding and it can be caused from like a multitude of things. Um, sometimes it has to do with like during a C-section something gets nicked that's not supposed to get nicked. Um, and sometimes it just has to do with like your sores and stuff that are inside. For example, like when your placenta detaches um, and you can just bleed and if it goes unchecked, you can pass and still can your child. 
Um, so then preeclampsia is like a form of high blood pressure. Um, and this is like incredibly fatal to both the mother and child should it go unchecked. And this is something that's incredibly common among women, which is why it's so important that it should get checked if it's noticed. Um, gestational diabetes is when the mother does not produce enough insulin to prevent her sugar from being high. Um, and that's also incredibly dangerous because it can pass to the child. Um, and then finally, cardiomyopathy, it is when the muscles in your heart get incredibly weak and they can no longer pump blood properly to the rest of your body and you basically are no longer able to survive. Um, so then going from maternal health care to then the gynecological side of things, underdiagnosis is a really huge part of why these things happen. Um, and on the screen, if you can see, there are three different diagnoses that um, don't get diagnosed very often. Um, there is adenomyosis, endometriosis, and PCOS. Um, adenomyosis is where you have your uterine tissue and it doesn't grow in the proper place. Instead, it grows into the muscular wall of your uterus and it is incredibly painful. Um, endometriosis is where instead of it growing into the muscular line of your um, uterus or even into the muscular wall, it grows on the outside, like on your fallopian tubes or it grows on your ovaries and obviously that's incredibly painful. And then finally, there is PCOS, which stands for polycystic ovary syndrome. And this one is actually more diagnosed than the first two, but it's still incredibly underdiagnosed. Um, and something that I find very interesting about PCOS is that oftentimes with PCOS, doctors will blame the weight gain instead of blaming the cause, I mean, instead of blaming what actually causes it, which is the PCOS. The weight gain is the symptom, not the cause. But doctors oftentimes overlook that. <clears throat> so how this relates to incarcerated pregnant women it has to do with the fact that they are an incredibly vulnerable population. So pregnancy itself is incredibly vulnerable because you can become high risk at any time. Um, you become concerned about more than just yourself. You now have a child that you have to figure out how to keep safe. Um, and then you also need more support for a multitude of reasons. Some of them have to do with health reasons. Some have to do with like overall making sure that you are mentally healthy. Um, and then when you look at incarceration, when you are incarcerated, you no longer have nearly as much choice as you had before. Um, you lose your rights or they are at least suspended. So for example, voting is one of those things. And in many states, when you get incarcerated, you lose the right to vote. And in some states, you can continue to vote as um, an incarcerated person, but most states are not like that and you lose it completely. You can't get it back. Um, and then finally, when you are incarcerated, you can lose friends and family and you can also lose your job. So when you think about how it relates together as someone who is pregnant and as someone who is incarcerated, it is an intersectionality of the two things and it makes someone incredibly vulnerable. Um, so then when you look at the fact that not every single need of every single person is met in the system, it becomes more clear when you look at the actual laws that are in place. So there are some federal laws and this is according to the American Civil, Lib American Civil Liberties Union. Um, and this states that Federal law says that there shouldn't be restraining of pregnant women. This is during childbirth, and this is also after childbirth. Um, you should have the ability to treat a high-risk pregnancy. So if someone should like develop preeclampsia or develop gestational diabetes, you should be able to treat it so that you have no death of the woman or the child. Um, you should also have prenatal examinations and testing to make sure there's nothing wrong with mother or child. And then finally, you should have nutritional guidance and counseling. But as you know, this isn't true everywhere because although, although these laws are in place, they're not enforced more times than not. Um, and there's also not a lot of documentation because it is required through law that every single woman who is in prison and gives birth, it has to be documented that they have given birth and at what time. A lot of places do not document it even though they are required. Um, and I wanna go ahead and talk about how even though this presentation is supposed to be about gynecology and about the maternal health of these women, there are not a lot of statistics on incarcerated women regarding their gynecological care. It mostly has to deal with like maternal health care and I feel like that's something that can be talked about later on. Okay, so some of the actual experiences of people here, um, in an article written by Ford in 2022, there was a woman named Jasmine Valentine. She was taken into prison at about I think 34 weeks, and they knew that she was really close to her due date. Um, and they actually put her in a cell that was near the nurse's station in case she went into labor. But what happened is when she went into labor and she was telling everyone that she's in labor and she needs some help, no one came to help her. They just let her sit in there for multiple hours and give birth on the floor of the jail, no assistance. And when they finally did come in and see that she gave birth on the floor, 
it took almost two hours more before they actually gave her an ambulance and took her away. And that just goes to show that there should be more laws in place for what happens. So then in an additional article by, by Santo in 2020, there were two women, Brittany Powell and Shakala Johnson. Brittany Powell, she was actually taken to an ambulance, I mean, taken to a hospital to give birth. And when she got there, her son had to go to the NICU because he had an infection. And she was given no updates afterwards. And literally the day after she gave birth, she was back in prison. They wouldn't allow her to breastfeed her child. And when they pumped her, they made sure to regularly drug test her. Um, and she said that made her feel like incredibly vulnerable because it's supposed to be like a time in which you're supposed to be able to spend time with your child, but at this time she wasn't able to. Um, and then with Shakala Johnson, her baby was actually put into state welfare because she went to this place and it's known at that prison to be able to hold the children of the women so that when they're released, they can still have their children. But she went and they actually rejected her because she was in jail for a assault charge. And so she had no family or no friends on the outside and the house actually rejected her. So her baby ended up going into state welfare. And she actually, know, she has no idea where her child is now because they don't give her updates on this child. So my policy statement is that women who are incarcerated should not be restrained while giving birth or while they're in labor, and that their baby should not be removed immediately after birth. Um, there should also be more prenatal care and abortion access to incarcerated pregnant women. Um, there should be prison nurseries in all prisons in the US and more access to them. And finally, there should be more guidelines on where these babies should go after they're born. Some support for this. So an article written in 2020 by Cross actually talks about the racial disparities in the system and how when you look at outside of the prison system, there are already racial disparities, but when you go into prison, they just are exacerbated. Um, and it talks about how like a lot of the experiences of black women and other women of color, um, they typically don't get addressed and they are actually less likely to be diagnosed with things. They're less likely to like get help if they are like in some type of danger. Um, and I just think that really is an important part to state. So then there are two articles, a 2009 and a 2011 article written by Howard Strabino, Sherman, and Crum. And these actually talk about the birth weight relationship between incarceration and the birth weight of the babies. And it's shown that if you are incarcerated in the second trimester, as opposed to if you are incarcerated in the first trimester, your baby has a lower birth rate. And I think it kind of shows that when you're in prison, you get treated differently than on the outside, which is why it's affected so much in the second trimester. Um, and then in a 2020 article by Franco, Mowers, and Lewis, it talks about how there are so many violations to women's rights while they're in prison. So for example, even though it's against federal law to be restrained while giving birth or in labor, people still experience that today. It goes back to Jasmine Valentine with when she was telling everyone that she's in labor and no one would believe her and she gave birth on the floor of a jail these are violations and this also has to do with reproductive care and how women who are incarcerated don't have the decision to decide when to have kids or when not to have kids such as with abortion access um so a 2020 article by kavanaugh shamsheri shin gaber liao van stone and kujmi john talks about how there are not enough laws in place to prevent these things from happening and when there are there just is not enough enforcement of these laws um, and so then a 2016 article by Fritz and Whiteacre talks about how prison nurseries actually are a very good thing because they increase the actual like pairing of the mother and the child. And it helps actually with the mental health of the mothers. It, de it decreases depression, it decreases anxiety, and the overall bonding between the mother and child is increased. Um, and then finally, this 2020 article by Rose and LaBelle, it talks about the benefits to mothers keeping their babies longer. So for example, they talk about how um, when the mothers give birth to their babies, the baby should not be taken immediately after birth because skin to skin contact is incredibly important. And it also talks about how, once again, with mental health, if you keep the babies with their mothers, for example, in prison nurseries for a longer amount of time, the women who have given birth, they have more time to like, get used to the idea of their child being out with their family instead of with them, and they don't struggle as much with depression or with anxiety. So the limitations of this policy is that funding is a huge deal. It's very difficult to get enough funding for these things. Um, but I would also like to state that while there is an issue, there is possibility of like reallocating resources from different parts of the prisons to other places where you know you need it with like the healthcare part. 
Um, so then with state laws regarding abortion and the overturn of like Roe v. Wade, I feel like there should still be a possibility of people who are in prison, if they decide that they don't want children, they should be able to get abortions. Um, and then finally, how the crime of the mother affects the treatment of her. So for example, with Brittany Powell, she was arrested on a drug charge and that's why they wouldn't let her breastfeed. And there was Shakala Johnson, how she was arrested for assault and then she wasn't able to get her baby into a house and her baby went into the state welfare program. Um, and these are things that I feel like should be considered when you're talking about implementing the policy change. And so in conclusion, I feel like prisoners are still human regardless of what it is that they do. And uh, it's especially true when it comes to what they're charged with, such as assault, such as with drug crimes and things like that. Um, and when you talk about like how rights are required and not recommended, the enforcement of these laws are incredibly important because it prevents these things from happening to women, from people having these horrible experiences um, and then also change isn't always easy, but it's often for the best. So while it will be difficult to implement these in the beginning because people are not used to it, you think about how many people's lives you are improving, not only the mothers of the children, but the children themselves. You're helping these mothers lessen the chance of getting depression, lessen the chance of getting anxiety, and also help with the bonding of the mother and the child. And so all of these things I feel like should help with this policy of implementing these changes so there are more laws to prevent these things from happening in the future. Thank you. All right, awesome, good job. You can just click there. Right there. All right, and I have to apologize because I totally messed this whole thing up, guys. How about that? Um, we were supposed to have breakout sessions. How many of you guys are in different rooms waiting? Yeah, some of you guys. Okay, well, welcome back. Okay, so we are going to have another student presentation from Lillian Richards from Baker. Is it Lillian? Is there, a... She's here. there she is. Sorry, we just totally messed all our speakers up. So that's this what that's what we do. We flex and flow here. Yes, so Lillian is going to come up, and then so then we were going to have Allison from Labette. Is Allison here? Allison, all right, so we'll, we'll get you up after this, okay? All right, so she gets settled. How, how, tell me, how, how is this for you guys? Good, thumbs up, thumbs sideways, and thumbs down, you don't like it at all. Yeah, good? All right, someone tell me, what, what have you liked most about this symposium so far? You can just talk out loud. Very good. Interesting. Statistical data to back it up, good. What about over here? What do you guys like most so far about this? Very good, yes. The student speakers, very good, very good. The ability to interact with other students, very good. How many of you guys met a new friend today? Did you guys meet a new friend? When I take our, our student government out or any clubs, that's the assignment. They have to find three new friends before they leave the conference. All right. Lillian, you ready? Okay. Yep, you can take it. Yes. Yep, come on up. I just wanted to quickly contextualize um, Ashanti and Lily's uh, presentations because um, you might be thinking policy proposal. What? are they talking about, right? So um, both Ashanti and Lily are seniors and undergraduate students at Baker. And in the fall, all of our seniors are required to take a capstone class called Contemporary Issues in Psychology, where they read contemporary psychological research, and then over the course of the semester, develop a significant policy paper that they typically present at a regional conference called Psychological and Educational Research in Kansas. And so several KCK, CC students came this fall to our conference and saw Ashanti and Lily present. Um, and then Dr. Amons was so generous to um, offer them the opportunity to be keynotes here. So we are, of course, enormously proud. And when you hear policy statement, that's what Ashanti and Lily are talking about. Okay, um, so I know we're like, this timing is a little off, so I'm gonna try to keep this moving, um, but there's time at the end if anybody has questions, you can come talk to me after or something too. Um, 
But today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about um, the modern psychedelic renaissance that psychology research has, in, has been in. Um, and specifically, we're going to focus on the therapeutic potential of LSD and DMT. So just to start off about where we are now in this kind of world of research, um, in the last year, five and a half million people have taken some kind of psychedelic drug. Um, the recreational use of psychedelic drugs has kind of been on the rise again, um, as it was originally in the 50s and 60s when this research started. Um, and initially, this led to the 1970 Contro Controlled Substances Act, which banned psychedelic drugs and classified them as Schedule I substances, meaning that there was no accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. Um, as we can see with like research today, that is changing. Um, a lot of research today is focusing on psilocybin, which are also known as magic mushrooms. Um, and 3,4-methylenodioxymethamphetamine, also known as MDMA or ecstasy. Um, if you look at the chart on the left, it kind of shows the amount of approved studies um, over the past couple of years towards researching psychedelics. Um, the like gray boxes are for psilocybin, orange is for MDMA, and the couple of blue boxes are for LSD, um, kind of showing that it's growing. But if you look at 2020, a record-breaking 17 studies were approved. Um, so this trend towards kind of finding out how these drugs can help people struggling with mental illness um, is definitely growing. So that's what today we're going to kind of talk about the new like psychedelic renaissance that the psychology world is experiencing. So um, as far as my policy goes, I want to focus on some of the lesser research psychedelic drugs because I believe that there's just as much potential here and they each have their own kind of like benefits and like specifications in treatment. Um, so we're going to be talking about lysergic acid diethylamide, also known as LSD or acid, um, and then n dimethyltryptamine, also known as DMT or ayahuasca. Um, so essentially what I'm going to be talking about or arguing for is that the National Institute of Health should increase funding for lesser research hallucinogens as they provide just as much, if not more, potential for the treatment of mental health disorders. So just a quick overview, we're going to look at how they work, we're going to look at how they can treat depression specifically, we'll look at how they can be integrated with traditional psychotherapy, and then we'll talk about whether or not they're dangerous because that is a main cause for concern for a lot of people when they hear about psychedelic drugs. So just to start, when we're looking at psychedelics, there's two classes um, of like, I guess they're chemical structures. And um, you have your phenethylamines, which are going to be um, MDMA and mescaline or peyote. And then you have what we care about more is your tryptamines. Um, these come from the amino, amino acid tryptophan. Um, and serotonin itself is actually a tryptamine. You can see it on the far side over there. Um, and then looking at these three drugs in comparison, psilocybin, DMT, and LSD, you can see that DMT is nearly identical to serotonin. Um, psilocybin differs from serotonin by one oxygen molecule, and LSD is a little bit scarier, um, <laughs> but it still has the same kind of serotonin like core, um, so it kind of shows how all of these drugs work in similar ways, and serotonin clearly plays a large role in like depression and kind of mood and cognitive function. So starting briefly with the serotonin system, um, this neurotransmitter in your brain um, strongly influences your emotions, um, drug and alcohol reinforcement and addiction, um, learning, memory, and a lot of your other cognitive functions. It plays a heavy role in depression, um, specifically your 5-HT2A serotonin receptor. Um, people that tend to have or tend to be high in neuroticism, high in suicidal ideation, and high in pessimism tend to have deficits in this receptor. Um, luckily, this is also the receptor that a lot of these psychedelic drugs bind to when they're working in your brain. Um, so therefore, they kind of have like a strong role in being able to improve that. Um, in addition, your serotonin system has a large role in brain plasticity, which is your brain's ability to kind of rewire and heal itself. Um, and so this is kind of a goal of like cognitive behavioral therapy is to tr try to break that cycle of like a negative thought, a negative feeling, a negative action, a negative thought. Um, and so while CBT can do this over the course of a couple months likely, um, there's potential for psychedelic drugs to uh, make this happen faster and like chemically rewire your brain to help break that cycle. Um, and I just wanted to briefly talk about how we know this, how we know that these drugs are what are called serotonin agonists, meaning they kind of stimulate it. Um, there was a study done by Smith et al. in 1998 where they gave rats different serotonin agonists and antagonists, and they trained them to like react in different ways, and then they gave the rats DMT, um, and the rats reacted to the DMT as if it was a serotonin agonist, so it's in this way that we're able to tell um, that this is what the drugs are doing to us. So um, looking at depression, so major depressive disorder, um, 21 million United States adults in 2020 suffered from major depressive disorder, or MDD. Um, this shakes out to be about 8.4% of all US adults. 
Um, it's the leading cause of disability worldwide, and it's also highly comorbid with other disorders like generalized anxiety disorder, with eating disorders, with suicidal ideation, with PTSD. Um, so it pops up a lot in the world of mental illness. Um, in addition, I wanted to note what DMT tends to have a lot of potential for is treatment-resistant depression. Um, this is for people that fail to respond to traditional like depression medications. Um, and these studies in 1996, 2015, and 2021 all found that a third of adults with depression failed to respond to treatment. So this is a 25-year span, span, and all of the studies have found the exact same thing, which clearly shows the need for a new kind of angle or something that we can do to work with people with TRD. So starting with major depressive disorder, um, the study by Schmidt and Leichty in 2017 gave participants 200 micrograms of LSD and followed up with them one month and then 12 months later, and they found significant positive improvements in attitude, mood, social behaviors, and just behavioral behavior in general. Um, so this kind of shows that over a month and over 12 months, these effects of just one single dose have lasted long term. Um, and then in addition, like looking at personality traits that are strongly correlated with depression, um, optimism and openness are two that people with depression tend to be low on. Um, but the study by Carhart Harris in 2016 gave participants only 75 micrograms of LSD. They had them complete an MRI, an MEG, a couple of qualitative interviews, and then do some like cognitive and behavioral evals. Um, and followed up with them two weeks later and found that participants had a significant increase in both their optimism and in their openness. Um, looking at treatment-resistant depression in DMT, um, a study by Pajano Fontes in 2019 gave people with TRD um, an evaluation and then they dosed them with ayahuasca and followed up with them one, two, and seven days after and found significant symptom improvement each time. Um, so that, that symptom improvement like kept up over the course of a week, which for people with TRD is really impressive because that is just extended depression that's just not getting better. Um, the one downside of ayahuasca is that it is like a tea that's found in a lot of indigenous cultures in South America. Um, and so the leaf that they use to make this tea um, has DMT in it. And so it causes a lot of unpleasant side effects. The big one is vomiting. Um, a lot of people when they consume ayahuasca will vomit and it's kind of seen as like a cleansing, but also if you're doing it for treatment resistant depression, it's not pleasant. Um, I don't think anybody wants that. So um, another option that a lot of like research has been doing is using like injections of DMT. Um, DMT is like a super, super fast trip. You usually hit like your high within five minutes and you're kind of back to normal within 20, especially when you inject it like that. So the study by D'Souza in 2022 injected participants that had TRD for an average of 27 years with DMT. Um, and they found that after receiving their injections, um, all participants came back to receive a higher dose. And then all of them showed significant improvement in their symptoms. Um, and that continued in the days following too. So for people who had been suffering from depression for 27 years, um, this was immediate, this like super fast treatment automatically increased their symptoms, um, which is one of its big benefits. So um, looking at how we can use them with therapy, um, we have what's called psychedelic assisted therapy and we have what I wanna talk about, which is psycholytic therapy. Um, psychedelic assisted therapy is when you're kind of doing like psychedelic doses kind of over time while also um, participating in traditional psychotherapy versus psycholytic therapy. Um, in this type of therapy, your therapist is with you throughout your trip is, what, is what's the easiest thing to call it. Um, a lot of people when they do these drugs recreationally or even in like religious settings, they'll have some kind of like trip setter or like a shaman or somebody to kind of guide you through the trip. And during psycholytic therapy, that is your therapist. Um, they'll help you kind of work through the emotions that you're experiencing, the feelings that you're having, um, and kind of help you process like any kind of traumas or any kind of negative feelings that are coming up. Um, in addition, uh, mystical experiences and ego dissolution is a really fancy word or fancy way for me to say like sense of self and spirituality. Um, this is an important part for everybody um, in their lives, especially when you're doing like psychotherapy. It's a really good way to kind of come to terms with yourself, with your life, and to feel better about things. Um, the study by Wiebner et al. in 2021 found that um, people, once they took LSD, showed higher levels of suggestibility, um, which is something that people will show after being in psychotherapy for like an extended period of time, so it's like a faster way to get there. Um, and through that suggestibility, you can kind of work with your therapist to more accept who you are, accept your life, expect your circumstance, accept your circumstances, um, that kind of thing. So it's just kind of a way to kind of get people to that point a little bit faster. 
Um, and then one last benefit too with LSD is because it's a longer trip, it's usually like 10 to 12 hours instead of psilocybin, which is like six to eight, um, you could potentially take like a lower dose and then spend time with your therapist to really work through some of your more core issues and some of your bigger traumas or things that are keeping you from being healthy. Um, so here's what a lot of people ask me about when I talk about this, um, is whether or not these drugs are dangerous. And so I wanted to address a couple of different things that are like really common um, when people think about psychedelic drugs. Um, so the first one is gonna just kind of be long-term effects of them because this research is so recent. Um, we can't really have a like definitive answer on long-term effects because we haven't been researching them long-term. Um, but there are a couple studies that show uh, like some signs of how it could be. So um, as far as like regular LSD use goes, they, there was a study done that gave rats LSD every other day for three months straight, which is a lot of LSD, those poor rats. Um, but then they, they stopped giving the rats LSD and the rats started showing symptoms of like schizophrenia. Um, and so there were two ways that this was fixed. So one, they just waited another three months and let that wear off. So again, those poor rats. Um, but then the second way that they did it is they gave the rats antipsychotic medication. Um, and antipsychotic medication acts on that same receptor that LSD acts on. So in a way, they were kind of giving them like a similar, like, I don't know, treatment, I guess. Um, but the way that that can be kind of like taken is that those like effects from LSD come from that changes to your serotonin system and to your neurotransmitters. It's not from withdrawals. So these drugs don't show any like symptoms of withdrawals. It's just kind of keeping your like chemicals balanced kind of thing, um, which is a good sign, obviously. Um, and then in addition, there was a study done on regular DMT use um, by I think it's Buso et al. in 2012. Um, and they looked at ayahuasca users and they did measures of their personalities, of their psychopathologies, of their life attitudes, and of their neuropsychological performance. Um, and then they came back a year later and evaluated the people who used ayahuasca regularly and found that they scored lower on psychopathology and they scored higher on neuropsychological performance, um, which actually can indicate that regular ayahuasca use can actually improve your brain um, and your brain functions. Um, and then they did use a control group and they compared them and found no significant differences a year later. So um, this is again like evidence for low risk of adverse effects for DMT and also for possible like positive effects in long-term use. As far as short-term effects go and like negative positive things that can happen while you're actually consuming the drug, um, DMT has been ranked on the global drug survey um, as having the least amount of negative side effects. Um, and being kind of the drug with like the, I don't, people ranked it as being like different from anything else they've ever taken. Um, and so again, the like reason for this is probably because a DMT trip is so short that there's not even really time for you to have like a negative effect because it's gonna wear off within like 10 minutes. Um, so in that sense, like a, a DMT trip tends to be ranked as like safer. Um, LSD on the other hand, um, as we know, has a much longer trip. So there's more of a possibility of having negative effects. Um, but the study by Copra et al. in 2022 looked at the 2017 Global Drug Survey and found that only 1% of LSD users sought emergency medical treatment during a trip. And um, for these people, it was primarily for anxiety and panic. So it was just that, like, I think I'm going to die. I have to go to the ER thing. Um, but for all of those people, those effects wore off within 24 hours. Um, so even then, like having that kind of variability there and that possibility of a bad trip can be controlled for if you're using it in a clinical setting. And then finally, I don't know how many of you have heard the like urban legend of my cousin's friend's friend that took too much acid and then started tripping for like two months straight. Um, but that's one that I have heard before. Um, and this study by Mueller et al. in 2022 um, gave 142 participants LSD, psilocybin, or both. Um, and then they followed up with them for a couple years afterwards to look at the frequency of flashbacks. Um, and they found that over half of them experienced one flashback and then were done. Um, of those, 13 of them experienced them about a little over a month later, and then they were good to go. Um, 11 of them experienced it a week after treatment, um, and then they were good. And then of all the people that experienced flashbacks, only two of them reported them being negative experiences. And I believe one of them was because they started taking um, an antidepressant, like an SSRI, that also messes with your serotonin system, which would, of course, you know, cause something, because this is all neurotransmitter focused. Um, but none of the flashbacks affected anybody's daily life. So it was more of just like a couple minutes of whoa. Um, but most people reported it being either positive or a neutral experience. 
Um, after two and a half years, they did follow up with everybody and only one person reported still experiencing flashbacks, but they were um, like not regularly experiencing them. But the, the main thing about this is that um, psilocybin and LSD showed similar rates of flashbacks and psilocybin is really close to being legalized. I think that for medicinal use, Oregon and maybe Colorado have approved it. Um, so the fact that LSD doesn't really differ also kind of gives it no reason for people to say like, oh, well, we shouldn't do this one because we're doing it with a different one. So just to kind of finish things off, um, Timothy Leary, I figured I can't do a presentation on psychedelic drugs without mentioning um, like the father of the hippie movement of the 60s. Um, but he once told people to tune in, turn on, and drop out. And you know, everybody at first was kind of like, oh, that's like a terrible thing. They're encouraging people to like leave society and kind of, I don't know, drop out of everything and go against the grain. But if you look at what he actually meant, um, it's actually really relevant and really important, especially in therapeutic settings. Um, by tune in, he meant tune in to your environment, the people that you interact with, the places that you are in, who you surround yourself with, um, and just kind of be aware of what's going on around you. By turn on, he meant get to know yourself and kind of get to be aware of your own emotions, your feelings, um, just your body, just the way that you're kind of doing in general. And by drop out, he meant like instead of saying like drop out of school, he meant drop out of things that make you unhappy. So if you're a part of a club that's making you unhappy, drop out. If you're working somewhere that's making you unhappy, look for a different job. Um, if you're spending time doing something that's making you unhappy, like remove that from your life. Um, and all of those things are kind of things that we can look at in therapy or in therapeutic situations. Um, but psychedelic drugs are also another way to get there and get there faster and get there healthier and have those effects stay. So in conclusion, I think that maybe the hippies were right and I think that maybe we should start listening to them. I don't, do we have time for questions or? Probably not. Okay. Because okay. I messed it up for everyone. That's sorry. All right. That was awesome. Wow. All right. So now we have Labette, right? Give it up for Labette Community College. Come on up. Hi everyone, my name is Allison Knopfsinger and I'm a freshman at Labette Community College. And today I'm here to share with you my research on starving for the thin ideal, which is basically eating disorders affecting teenage girls in the world of dance. So I'm keeping it short and sweet for you guys today because I know we're running short on time and slightly old fashioned because I do not have a PowerPoint, just my words, so. <laughs> So I have been involved in the dance community most of my life, whether that's teaching, mentoring, or even dancing myself. And I've seen firsthand the detrimental effects that eating disorders have played in the world of dance. As a teenage girl ballet dancer, you are so susceptible to developing an eating disorder due to the negative body stereotypes. Adolescent girls who participate in a aesthetic sports such as ballet experience the highest rates of clinical eating disorders. In the world of dance, there are extreme pressures to obtain and maintain extremely thin body frames. With the use of things like mirrors and constantly being evaluated on large scales, coaches offer a constant flow of encouragement to withhold their low body weights. In comparison to non-dancers, adolescent female ballerinas are known to experience neurotic perfectionism, anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, and body dysmorphia on extremely large scales. Having an eating disorder while being a high-functioning athlete leads you to be at risk for injuries and susceptibility to illness. As a result of EDs, a majority of female ballet dancers experience physical effects like irreversible bone loss, muscle mass decreasing, and brittle hair, and that doesn't even begin to dive deeper into the physical effects that will last into their adulthood way past their teenage years and their career in the dance world. Dancers' environment, peers, parents, and, and coaches, excuse me, have the largest effects on the dancers and their personal body image. The ideal of the perfect ballet body is extremely harming, especially when so heavily pushed on young women that are developing and growing into young women. It is a social standard involving being unhealthily thin, which is very unrealistic and unattainable without developing an eating disorder. Women's bodies have stayed the same all through time. Really, what has changed are the damaging and altered social ideas of what a woman's body should look like. 
A 19-year-old female who has danced for 15 years was interviewed to gain insight on her personal experience with eating disorders. The 19-year-old explained that almost as soon as she hit puberty, she was encouraged by her coaches to maintain her childlike thin frame. She was encouraged to keep up her high level of activity while intaking few to almost no calories. She described that because of almost all the time that they spent in front of mirrors, they were constantly scrutinized for their physical appearance and were often seen looking at themselves, grabbing their stomach and arms and comparing themselves to their peers, wanting that validation for being extremely thin. The adolescent reported that due to her highly praised eating disorder, she fell victim to many injuries, four of which needing major reconstructive surgeries before the age of 18. She consistently fell ill because of her almost non-existing immune system and reported that she was so ill she could hardly get out of bed every three weeks. She explained that during the holidays, all dancers were encouraged and reminded to not eat at family gatherings. She was told that if she wanted to eat a candy bar, that it needed to last a week. And that's so unrealistic for all of us. While dancing over 30 hours a week and intaking almost nothing, she experienced many fainting spells during rehearsals that were totally overlooked for the sake of being thin. The 19-year-old disclosed that she was a five-year scholarship student at her highly praised studio, but had many threats over those years to have that revoked if she didn't go back to her unhealthy ways of her eating disorder very quickly. The interview dancer provided insight on the unhealthy ways teenage dancers are encouraged to uphold a prepubescent type body. Her experience is all too common within adolescent girls in the ballet world, but that extends way far beyond the dance world. That happens to young women and men everywhere. The world of ballet is, very, is a very competitive culture. It's inclusive of several environmental elements, such as uniforms, costumes, mirrors, and the image of the ideal dancer's body. The competitive field causes extreme stress on the dancers. The culture is more about having the correct look rather than loving what you're doing and being healthy. Even when away from the studio, most are always haunted by the idea of, will I look good enough? Will I be thin enough? And that follows them for the rest of their lives. It was predicted and hypothesized before I began my research that young dancers are extremely at risk for developing eating disorders. And through my research, um, which I pulled most of my research from an academic journal by um, Nicole Doria and Matthew Number, which was published in 2022 called Dancing in a Culture of Disordered Eating. I concluded that that is quite fact, factual. And according to the AD, 10% of our population in the United States are experiencing clinical eating disorders. And that just attests to the ones that are reported. This is a crisis that is sweeping across our nation, and the first thing that we can do, whether we are experiencing it or somebody we know, whether it's in an aesthetic sport or not, is to reach out for help. Talk to your therapist, talk to a friend, talk to a doctor, because that is the first way that we are going to be able to combat this unhealthy movement that's moving through our society. Thank you. All right, good job. Wow, you guys are so smart. Just saying, I mean, that's amazing. Um, all right, so uh, now we are going to st do some moving. Um, our students uh, are going to do a poster presentation. So all of those students who are doing their presentations, why don't you go ahead and get up first and get to your, your poster. And we ask everyone to, you know, how many of you guys have seen poster presentations before? Okay. Good. For those of you who haven't, what you're going to do is you're going to walk to each different poster and those students are going to explain to you the research similar to up here, but they're going to do it at their poster. And you get to ask them questions about different things that's on some data, facts, or whatever on their poster, okay? So we want you guys to challenge them, right? Make them answer questions. All right. Get up and have some fun.
did you think about um, something like their socioeconomic status, first generation?
All right, guys, we have about four minutes before we get started. Four minutes. All right, we have a two-minute warning, two minutes before we get started, two minutes. All right, everybody, why don't you come on over and, and come back to your seats. We're about to get started with the next speaker. Great job on your poster presentations. All right. Come on over. Back to everyone's chairs so we get ready for the next amazing speaker we're gonna have here. All right, guys, intense. Come on in, guys, we're about to get started. All right. Wow, that was fast. Everyone got quiet really, really fast. All right, well, how was the poster presentations? Good? Eh, not so good? Good job. They did some, a lot of research, didn't they? I'm telling you guys are amazing students. Um, we have students who presented from here at KCKCC. I think uh, Baker, Park University, Butler, the Butler present, and Labette, Labette, did you guys present? Nope, just that one, okay. All right, well, we have um, a speaker who is returning, a returning speaker here, and so excited, uh, Dr. Um, Anna Pope from the University of Kansas. So come on up, give her a round of applause, yeah. Okay, awesome. I wanna thank everyone for inviting me back to talk again. Obviously last time it didn't go that poorly, so it must be okay. So here I am again to speak to you all. 
And I wanna start by saying thank you for sharing your research with all of us today. I find it so exciting to see undergraduate research from students at various colleges, from students here, from students all over the place, sharing the work that they've done, sharing the work that they put their passion into. And I find that undergraduate research has become one of my major passions as a professor in the last 10 or so years. And I wanna say thank you again for being here and presenting your work. My goal is twofold today. I'm going to share a cheap and easy solution to all gender restrooms. And I'm also going to share the social change that undergraduate research can cause through the research itself, both at the same time with the same project. It'll work. So, wow, this is a different color than I expected. That's okay though, I can tell you what it says. I wanted to say thank you, and I wanted to say that undergraduate research is very valuable. We're used to undergraduate research being sold as a way for you to get into graduate school, as a way for you to help with your job applications, as a way for you to move on to the next thing. And I will say that even though I've only been a faculty member for seven years now, I've had students move on to multiple PhD programs, master's programs, real world work scenarios in industrial organizational psychology, and even school psychology in the local districts. These are all students that I worked with in research. Their beginning was finding a research project that they were passionate about, collecting the data, analyzing the data, presenting it at an event like this, and that helped lead them on their journeys to all these different career paths and outcomes. And I'm so proud of what my students have done, and I really want to show off what student research can do. Because this is all talking about where can it get you later, but now I want to talk about what can it do immediately afterwards. If you do the kind of social justice and activism type of research that I do in my research lab, what can you do with that? So we're actually looking at the current state of all gender or inclusive restrooms in colleges, right? We in the Midwest have been kind of flirting with and playing with inclusive restrooms for years now, right? I'm sure one restaurant you went to 10 years ago had an all gender restroom. And that was, that was unusual and interesting and probably cleaner than most restrooms. Then a few random schools might start having inclusive restrooms. Perhaps you might see it at a hotel somewhere, but it's not consistent in the Midwest, not in any way, shape, or form. And what we see happening is that across the country, we have multiple types of legislation against the transgender community. So we have legislation being passed and brought to the, brought to the floor about restricting bathroom access, restricting access for medications and treatments, and generally across the board, taking away rights and protections for transgender and non-binary persons. And this is a persistent social issue that's been a social issue for years and going to keep being a social issue. I'm gonna go over how it's affecting the two states that we're currently close to, you know, one foot's in Kansas, one foot's in Missouri. So we're gonna talk about those two. But I wanna tell you how I got there. I got there through a casual conversation in my research lab. A year before we started this project, my campus had started inclusive restrooms, all gender restrooms. We didn't do it beautifully. I'm gonna show you a picture of it. We didn't do it beautifully. We just put an all gender restroom on the middle of the bathroom door we still had the men's room or the women's room sign on there. Really awkward. It was just our currently existing multi-stall restrooms, just the way they were. But we did it, right? We put up those signs, and we put up signs that encourage people to use the restroom that's consistent with their gender identity and that they're comfortable with, telling them that we had their back as a campus if they wanted to use the restroom. So I was talking to my students during a lab meeting about how no one has ever really shown what happens after you do all gender restrooms, right? People tell you that if you have all gender restrooms, people are going to stop using the bathroom, enrollment's going to drop, people are going to run away, perhaps the world will end, another pandemic will happen from inclusive restrooms. And there's no data to suggest that. Problem is, 
There's no data to suggest that it'll be okay either. There's no data to suggest that nothing bad will happen, and there's no data to suggest that anything good will happen. And I was complaining about that to my students, and one of my students just looks at me and says, well, Dr. Pope, we've had our restrooms for a year. Why don't we collect the data? Well, why don't we collect the data? And we did. We decided to go forth and collect the data to show what had happened after our inclusive restrooms. And the reason we should care is because this map from the ACLU that shows the number of anti-LGBT bills in the system, a month ago when we were first trying to use this for our campus tunnel of oppression, which is an educational piece we do for our students, a month ago when we were first starting, that number was 350. Last week it was 435, now it's 449. We've had to update that image on our tunnel of oppression every couple of days in order to keep it accurate. And specifically, in Missouri, there are 48 bills currently that are considered anti-LGBTQ. This includes everything from restrictions for K-12 students to restrictions on how education monies can be spent. There's a bill out there suggesting that education monies from the state government should not be used for diversity, equity, and inclusion causes. All of those different types of bills are going to be affecting youth, right? These are going to be affecting K-12 students, banning students from being able to access restroom, from being able to access healthcare, from being able to be on sports teams. And this is across both Kansas and Missouri and many other states. And these are affecting our transgender students, our students who identify with a gender other than the one they were assigned at birth, our non-binary students, students who don't identify with the gender binary, or anyone else who identifies as gender minority. These are our students, right? The students who will be in college soon, the students who are currently in K-12. So theoretically, we know that for transgender youth, bathroom use is considered a major stressor, generally, trying to figure out where to go to the bathroom, how to go to the bathroom, and who's going to have a problem with you going to the bathroom. Generally, research supports that the youth the other kids are pretty supportive about the idea of inclusive restrooms. In fact, positive social norms lead them to be more in favor of inclusive restrooms. If we can just have those positive social norms there for the students, then that can help reduce one of the major stressors for these students. Because we know that gender affirmation helps gender minority students do better in classes, helps them feel more comfortable, helps them explore their identity more, and just generally be happier kids, which is something mostly I want. And I want you to think about in the next five or 10 years, the students who are going to be coming to our colleges at 18, 19 years old, straight from high school, those students who identify as gender minority are going to have faced sports bans they're going to face bathroom restrictions. They're going to face lack of access for medical care. So they are going to have dealt with this. And I encourage us as college campuses to welcome them with open arms, to help affirm their identities, to help legitimize who they are and make them feel more positive and be welcoming in its communities. One way we can do that is by having things like inclusive or all gender restrooms. So we actually collected this data from our classrooms. We went into classrooms, my students collected all the data, going into classrooms, giving a QR code, five minute survey, tell us, did you even know about the restrooms? Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel safe? Do you feel that the restrooms are supportive? And do you feel that our super awkward signage, I showed you what it looked like, is supportive and helpful? Spoiler, no one liked that. And then we also measured some other things. We tried to measure comfort and dysphoria and some of the classic individual difference factors that predict transphobia. So we looked specifically at right-wing authoritarianism or support for traditional structures, traditional values and authority. We looked at gender essentialism, which is the belief that there are essential and meaningful physical and psychological difference between men and women that cannot be changed. And then we also looked at political affiliation with higher values being on the conservative side because I knew which direction the correlations were gonna go. So our restrooms look like this and people told us how they felt about them. And generally, we had a scale that looked like this 
where moderately comfortable or moderately safe in the restroom was in the middle point of the skull. Now, just to kind of throw it out there, when you think about using a public restroom, how often do you walk away saying like, oh yes, I was moderately comfortable in that restroom. <laughs> Most of the time, all I can think about is how gross it was, how I really wanted to leave the restroom, and how I'm really frustrated that I had to be in there as long as I had to. So I think moderately is a good score. And we had very few students say that they were less than moderately comfortable just about 25% of them said they were less than moderately comfortable with the person of another gender being in the restroom with them in the all gender restroom. And then less than 15% said that they were less than moderately safe. And if you look at this graph, this shows the difference between people who were aware of the restroom and were not aware of the restroom. This is testing the idea that people are going to find out about restrooms and then be as scared of them, drop, drop their credit hours, whatever. And what we actually found was that in general, people who were aware of the all gender restrooms were actually more comfortable, more comfortable with people of other genders in the restroom with them, and also felt more safe in the restroom. In general, we found pretty significant evidence that knowing about the restrooms actually made you feel better about them, which was great. That was more than we could have asked for. We also found that in general, that these conservative ideologies, these individual difference factors, political ideology, right to authoritarianism, and gender essentialism are negatively correlated towards every type of support for our inclusive restroom. We have more details on our poster over there if you'd like to see it. We also saw that comfort and safety was higher among people who knew about the restrooms and that gender minority students actually reported that they felt supported by the inclusive restroom policy. However, they said they were supported by the inclusive restroom policy, not statistically significant. We only had 12 gender minority persons, so it was very hard to get statistical significance, so I'm just looking at the means here. But we did not find that they said that the signage was benefiting them because the signage was terrible. So. What I really want to report about this is this is research that was started by undergraduates, mostly completed by undergraduates, and we collected the data, and I brought it to the leadership at campus. And I said, hey, here's this data. It shows that our students are generally supportive of the restrooms. Only four out of 155 said they wouldn't use the all gender restrooms. And here's some free response data suggesting that we really need to work on our signs, add trash bins to all of the stalls in the all-gender restrooms, and add menstrual products to all the all-gender restrooms. And the leadership was very helpful. They said, yeah, let's do it. <coughs> so before we did our research study, we had these kind of awkward, confusing signage. Afterwards, new all-gender restroom signs, new signs telling you which restrooms on campus Every one of our buildings has one floor with all gender restrooms and the other two floor with traditional segregated restrooms. Signs telling you where the restrooms are, signs telling you to use the restroom that you align with. And generally, we use the data from this research, from an undergraduate research project, in order to change campus policy for the better to be more inclusive towards our students. And I couldn't be more proud of my students for helping with this. So I have three quick take homes. We have evidence to suggest that inclusive restrooms are helpful for gender minority students. And think about it this way, 12 out of 155 in my sample. That's 10% of the size of my small campus and about 10% of that sample, meaning we have quite a few gender minority students at our campus. So including them is valuable, useful, and a good use of our time. A cost-effective restroom swap worked, right? We didn't redo the plumbing. We didn't do anything wild. We didn't get a bunch of single stall restrooms with locks and everything. We just used our existing restrooms, made them inclusive, and told people that we had their backs on it. And that was enough to get the conversation started. I find one of the biggest barriers to inclusive or all gender restrooms is people say that we're going to have to spend tens of thousands on plumbing. You could or you could do it this way as a filler until the next time you renovate your restroom. 
Then finally, I wanted to know that inclusive restrooms did not bring the next apocalypse, right? Nothing bad happened. My students didn't stop going to the bathroom. Everything was fine, right? It's been two years now since we first did our inclusive restrooms and our campus still exists, our students are still happy, and some of our students are more comfortable. So I wanted to say thank you to all of my students who have helped with this by sharing this as many places as I can. I'm sharing this at conferences, I'm sharing this at campuses like this, and encouraging people to talk to me about how simple our intervention was, how you could collect data to make sure it went okay too if you tried it, and to spread it to more places. Next year, we will be publishing in the special issue of LGBT Youth to talk all about our results. We'll be talking about both our results from our students, which we currently have, and then also the same results from our faculty and staff at our campus to show support on both sides, hopefully. So the last thing I wanna say is extra thank you to my student, Junie, for being here today to present the research poster. Extra thank you to Jacob Randall, one of my research students who talked me into this. He is the one who told me we need to do this. He's my co-author on the publication we're working on, and he has just been an amazing source of motivation to just get this done. I would have put it off to later had my students not encouraged me. And then finally, I want to thank my student, Ryan Crossland, for making this helpful infographic on how to use inclusive restrooms. If you look at it, you'll notice it's a little facetious, right? It tells you just go to the bathroom like normal and don't bother people. It's not special. It's the same type of bathroom use you've always done. So that's it. I wanted to share how helpful, how meaningful, and the fact that undergraduate research can make change. So keep it up. Keep working on your undergraduate research. Keep pursuing your passions. It can very much impact things not just your own ability to apply to school in the future, but also can actually make change at your campuses, your communities, et cetera. Thank you so much for your time. I will be around shortly for questions if anyone wants to chat with me afterwards, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak to you again this year. Thank you. All right, that was awesome. And she is absolutely right. And I'm gonna give a nice little plug because I'm a proud mama. My daughter went to KU and was in the research program, not her research program, but she did a lot of undergraduate, undergraduate research. And she um, went to Boston University and she's graduating this May. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. She started here at KCKCC with all of our psychology faculty, moved on and then I was there. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, so you guys are gonna, you're gonna be there, right? Yeah, you're, you're, you're headed in the right direction. Hey, I wanna give, um, if all of our KCKCC faculty, um, are, if you're here, would you stand? We would just wanna recognize you guys because you guys make it happen for our students. Right over there, right over there, yes. Right there. Our students, you know, love the psychology program. It's, it's one of our top programs here, so keep going, guys. Keep going, okay? All right, so I would like to introduce to you um, the president of Kansas City, Kansas Community College, um, Dr. Greg Mosier. He's going to come up and, um, yep, that's you. Come on up and give her a big round of applause, Dr. Greg Mosier. Well, hello, good afternoon. How's everyone? Good. Boy, I was walking around looking at the displays earlier, and what great work. So really good job to everyone. Um, congratulations on that. It's really nice to see research at the community college level, uh, because you can do research anywhere. So we're really happy that it's taking place. We're really thankful for our faculty as Ms. Andrika said, who are helping build a culture of research here at KCKCC. So that's terrific. And uh, today I have the privilege to do something a little bit special. So hold on. So. And I printed it real big so I can see it as I get older. <laughs> no. So I'd like to recognize someone who's really been instrumental here at KCKCC. Um, and especially in getting this research component added to our curriculum. So 
a lot of you probably met him or if you were from somewhere else or uh, if you're in his classes, you know him rather well. And that's Dr. Anto Antonio Cutulo Ring. So where's Dr. Cutulo? <laughs> awesome. So, so if, if a man, Antonio, man, thanks for all you've done. Uh, Antonio has been really consistent here at the college and a passionate presence as a faculty member here at KCKCC for, get this, 30 years. So awesome job. He has an incredible passion and dedication and commitment to the students and the mission of the college, and it's been illustrated year after year during those 30 years. Uh, he's been very active in many different aspects of the college operations, well beyond just the role of a faculty member. You see Antonio everywhere. You know, his activities in various committees over the years have had a great impact and lasting influence on our students, but our faculty and staff and our community as well. So um, even with a passionate commitment to education, it's really well known that you notice his laughter, right, and his consistent willingness to help just wherever he is. He's always engaging his peers and his students in vigorous debate and conversation about all things uh, psychology, and sometimes not. <laughs> right? So if you know the uh, former uh, Ch Chief Justice Scalia from the Supreme Court, uh, Dr. Cotullo also is one not to shy away from a very lively discussion, let's say, <laughs> right? He, also, uh, he often uses his skills as a gestalt therapist to actively get people to engage and notice their own emotional reactions to something that's going on. He's always willing to sit with heightened emotions and it's unique and he often leads with an increased awareness of their own emotional state. Once a therapist, always a therapist, right? <laughs> so, um, Dr. Cotullo, your passion, your genuineness, your commitment to KCKCC and our students, it will really be missed. So, Antonio is retiring this year. So, yeah, greatly missed. Um, Dr. Cotullo Ring, you have been really indispensable and helpful in forming of the KCKCC Psychology Club, and your mentorship and guidance will be greatly missed as well. So can I get you to come up on stage for a bit? Can I give you this? Wow. And one day you're going to get there, right? Yeah. Retirement. That's so far away, right? Okay. Hey, um, we are so excited to get um, ready for our poster awards. Ha ha. So uh, we had judges walk around and um, judge your guys' posters and your conversation. And, you know, it was really awesome. So uh, did you guys know there was judges walking around? No? Yeah, maybe so. Okay, well, there were. And come on up, uh, Dr. Marin Leon Barajas. 
Marin, sorry, <laughs> I messed it up. All right. All right. All of, no, I think I got it. Thank you. Um, all of the posters were really wonderful. So a uh, round of applause for all of our poster presenters. <laughs> so it was a really close call. Um, we do have third place. So, and I do want um, anyone whose name I call today, go ahead and email your information to Mr. Ammons. He's got um, not only a monetary prize, but also a plaque. So you can receive those um, through emailing him. In third place, um, we have Dr. Anna Pope, um, who discussed um, gender inclusive restrooms. Round of applause for her. In second place, we have Sarah Mathis, who discussed the nudge theory. And in first place, drum roll, <laughs> is Kenneth Damar in Paris discussing African American academic psychology, representation, and engagement. <laughs> nice job, everyone. All right, wasn't that awesome? That's exciting. Ha, ah, that is so awesome. And, uh, and if I, correct me if I'm wrong, but Sarah, where are you at, Sarah? You are, you're, you came to KCK. Are you an alum? Her mom's an alum, though. That's what matters, right? Woohoo! So she came, uh, Sarah came and presented last year here at the, the uh, uh, research and sympo symposium. So it's awesome. So it could be you next, right? I keep saying that. It's you next, right? So keep going. You know, keep doing your research, keep talking uh, to people, get a mentor if you're like, sure, I'm not sure how to do this. Um, if Just talk to someone and we will get you the help um, that you need to be able to get to this place and beyond, right? Right? All right, turn to the person next to you and say, you're going to do this next year. <laughs> you're going to do this next year. It's you, you, right? You. I see you. All right. We're going to welcome up the uh, creator, the founder the man, come on up, Victor Ammons. He made all of this possible, just saying. I just want to say thanks for everybody coming. Uh, somebody had to remind me earlier today that some people drove from as far as Wichita area. Uh, we had our friends from Labette. Thanks for coming. Uh, there'll be more information coming out this week, uh, like, uh, like the Vice President said earlier on. We will open it up now, not only to psychology students, but we'll open it up to, uh, to anybody in the social and behavioral sciences. I also want to, in a very special way, thank Dr. Marin. Marin has, was a student here. She graduated. She now has a PhD from KU. And, and my statement to Marin was, what I really want her to come is, you can see yourself in Marin. Also, the other two judges, where are the other two judges? They had to go. Okay, the other two judges were also, well, uh, one is a lawyer, one is a student. Uh, uh, Bradley Enrique Lopez, uh, he's currently working on his PhD, he was a student at KCKCC. And also, uh, Sarah Dugan. Sarah was a student here. She graduated uh, when I became a police officer for a few years, then left the police force, went to UMKC Law. She now works for Kriegel and Kriegel. What we'll try to do is every time we are having this symposium, we'll try to see if we can get alumni to participate in it. In that way, students sitting there can say, like Andreka said, I will see you up here next time. Thank you very much. Now, for all the students, just before I give the mic to uh, Marin, uh, for all the students, if you can just somehow, after Marin gets to talking, to just come back here and we'll take a picture with the great Antonio. And if Dr. Mosher is still around, we'll take a picture with Dr. Mosher and Yelena and the rest of the psychology team. Thank you.
I have a, a slight correction to make, so my apologies. I did not realize that the poster presenter was not Dr. Anna Pope, but her student, Junie. And so I'd like to correct that. My, uh, it was entirely my fault. So wonderful job, Junie. All right, can we have you guys come on up to the podium or podium, the stage here? Come on up and be tight and don't leave because uh, we want to make sure everybody's included, right? Tall people in the back, short people in the front. Come on over, don't be shy. Squish in, squish in. All right. Don't be shy. Come on up. Yep, come on up. Squish in, guys. Squish in. Yeah. No. All right. And we might have some people who might kneel in the front. You, you guys can kneel in the front if you want. Yeah. We could probably put him up there. Let's see, where's Dr. Mosier and Antonio? <laughs> All right. Squishing, squishing. Short people in the front, tall people in the back. Okay, Antonio and Dr. Mosier, come on over here. You guys, can you guys climb up on the stage? I'm gonna put you right here next to Miss Orlando and yeah, come on up. Let uh, Dr. Mosier and Antonio, yeah, come on over. Yeah, for real, come on over. All right, let them scoot in, guys. There we go. And if I could, if I could have you just scoot over just a little bit, that way they can be right there in the center. Yeah, Dr. Mosier, right there. Do your thing. All right. Let's see. Randy, where, Randy, does that look good? 